Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director of Casa Italiana, and I'm delighted to present this program that we are offering tonight. Um, it's a one-of-a-kind experience. It's a film that none of us probably has ever seen, unlike the film that we presented uh, last night, for which we had about 300 people and that everybody more or less had already seen. Interesting uh, choices, but uh, tonight's film is a, is a silent film that has been given new voice and new sound uh, by a contemporary musician and composer. But before we start with the screening of the film, The Fawn, an Italian film from 1917, we have the fortune of having here with us Professor Vito Adriansens, um, who is a professor of film studies at Columbia University, who specializes in silent films and especially in the relationship between the visual arts and cinema. And his latest book is on uh, screening statues, sculpture, and cinema. And whereas the comparison between cinema and the visual arts, especially painting, is a rather uh, navigated one by many scholars, um, the relationship with sculpture, I would say, it's much more unique. And it's a, basically a virgin field of study that Professor Adrian uh, explored. And since you will understand why the book is so relevant to the understanding of the film, because the film is basically about a statue that comes alive, and we don't want to say anything else. Um, so we are very happy to offer to you this, what I believe it's a, it's a very interesting, fun, and refined uh, point of coincidence between uh, sculpture and cinema, both in the presentation of uh, Professor Adjensen's book and in the screening of the film. And without further ado, since in this field I'm absolutely ignorant, I'm asking Professor Adjensen to take the podium and tell us about his book first, and then to introduce the film and the uh, live soundtrack that will accompany it. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, and thanks to Stefano and Julian and Kostya and uh, everyone at the uh, Casa Italiana for setting this up. Uh, first, uh, a, a few practical announcements. Uh, even though my first name is Vito, uh, I am 0% Italian. So uh, I'm a bit of a fake Italian in the house tonight. Uh, my parents were big fans of The Godfather. And um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that's not a joke. Um, so tonight I have the, uh, the pleasure of um, presenting uh, a book that I co-authored um, with a few wonderful people called uh, Screening Statues, Sculpture and Cinema. This is the uh, hardback version, but the uh, paperback is coming out soon. So this is actually uh, more of a paperback pre-order party uh, rather than a book presentation. Um, just because I couldn't get any physical copies of uh, the book, they're sold out in hardback, so I had to go to my local library uh, and find a copy. So I'm hoping that that's a good sign, um, but you tell me. You can pre-order the uh, paperback on Amazon or wherever you get books these days. Uh, and it should also uh, pop up in MoMA uh, around February somewhere. So uh, before we see the film, which is about an hour and 10 minutes long, just to give you a heads up, I won't go on too long with this introduction, and we'll have time for questions also afterwards. Um, I'll tell you, uh, a few, I'll say a few words about how the book sort of set up, what types of films you can expect in the book. Um, Roma Città Aperta is actually one of them as well. Uh, a lot of Italian films, uh, including uh, Fauno, which is also uh, in there. So the, um, the book actually started out as a project about eight years ago um, when I was working on my PhD. Uh, set out as a megalomaniacal project, uh, an encyclopedic uh, volume that set out to register all fictional art and artists uh, in film. And after about one month, we realized that that was not going to be very practical. Um, so we devised different projects. And one of the things that sort of came to light um, was that there's tons of very interesting interactions between sculpture um, between sculpture, sculpted humans especially, and uh, 
quote unquote real humans, and you'll see in the film tonight that uh, the distinction is not always easy to be made um, in film, and that you know not a lot of people had written about this, as opposed to uh, paintings uh, in film, especially in horror films and especially in early cinema. Um, it, it actually, the book actually grew from uh, an obsession with peplum cinema, for which the Italian cinema is also renowned. Uh, a first wave of which you can actually see in early cinema with films like The Last Days of Pompeii and uh, a lot of great gladiator films uh, as well. Hopefully I can come back and present one of those gladiator films uh, soon. Uh, but tonight's film is equally fun, I can guarantee it. So uh, the book is basically uh, two parts. The first part, uh, your more uh, academic uh, chapter book, uh, seven or eight parts, I should say. Um, that sort of detail the history of the interaction between sculpture and cinema chronologically. So we start out with the, the very earliest of interactions, and I'll show you a few examples uh, soon on with Georges Méliès's living statues, uh, be they wax, cardboard, or actual sculpted material. Uh, there's also a great erotic film company by the name of Saturn, an Austrian film company that made films in which the... Um, uh, the disguise of humans in the form of sculpture was always uh, erotically charged, so to speak. You'll have to come to the Austrian house for a presentation on that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, we moved on into the 1920s and 30s with surrealist films, which is where uh, Susan Fellman comes in, who works at the University of South Carolina and has also extensively written uh, on this subject. Moving into modernism and cinema with uh, you know, films on Rodin, a lot of documentaries made on uh, Rodin, as you can imagine, and discovering new ways of looking at sculpture through cinema. As you know, if you've ever been to a museum, which I'm assuming you have, and seen any sculpture, the, uh, the sculpture is much harder to grasp than the physical uh, painting, of course, because you can walk around it. It's three-dimensional. So it poses some challenges for film, which is, of course, a two-dimensional medium. So we'll see that uh, both in this film, but also in experimental films of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. Um, directors and editors will always try and give you uh, an idea of what a sculpture looks and feels like by cutting around it, uh, sometimes also by applying water, by applying oil, special types of lighting, um, to make it really come to life. Uh, and then, of course, there are those instances where they actually do come to life, uh, which brings us to chapter four, Mysteries of the Wax Museum. Um, one of the subsets of uh, the statue film or the sculpture film, if you will, uh, is that set in the Wax Museum. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have probably seen a variation of this already, whether it's House of Wax with Vincent Price, uh, the original film, The Mystery of the Wax Museum, that it's based on by Michael Curtiz, uh, or even um, in most recent uh, Halloween-type iterations. Um, these sort of settings, especially a museum setting, are ideal, and wax is also an ideal material because it, you know, uh, marble and stone are one thing, but wax is something that really approximates the, um, the human texture. If you've been to the Met Breuer for the uh, recent exhibition, you could see that sort of in action. Um, so that's what these films uh, sort of play on. The book also talks uh, about more classic films that you might think of when you're thinking about um, sculpture and cinema like Jean-Luc Godard's Le Mépris or uh, L'année dernière à Marion Batz, the Alain René film. Um, so we have all that covered. The last uh, two chapters, uh, one of which I wrote, Of Swords, Sandals, and Statues, is about peplum cinema, how the technology of cinema uh, makes statues come to life. If you've seen Ray Harryhausen films from the 60s and 70s, You've seen it done uh, a million times today with CGI uh, and all kinds of iterations of classical mythology uh, on the screen. And as I'll mention in a minute, that's really what drives most of these films is some idea of mythology. It all goes back to uh, the urtext of uh, Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses, as we'll see. Uh, and the last uh, chapter in the book is sort of a coda which talks about um, film as sculpture, sculpture as film, projected light as sculpture, uh, which is something that takes us into the realm of museum once again, uh, but in the form of light sculptures. So this is the, uh, the first part of the book, uh, really dealing with issues from 1898 to, let's say, 2013, because that's when we uh, 
had to uh, get the manuscript in first. Uh, we continued working on that. My uh, personal contributions uh, in the first part, meaning you can ask me anything about those. I'll also answer questions about anything else, really. Uh, I'm here anyway. But um, are pertained in three chapters. Uh, early cinema, which is sort of the field I work in, and I also teach early cinema at um, Columbia. The uh, Wax Museum Horror Film, which is chapter four, and then the um, chapter on peplum cinema, so anything 60s, 70s, uh, all, the way today, all the way to today, uh, myth mythological reincarnations on, uh, on the screen. And then there is also the uh, second part of the book, which if you don't like reading uh, analytical texts about cinema, uh, also gives you pictures, which is always nice. Uh, the second part of the, uh, of the book is sort of a reference gallery. As I've said before, we uh, sort of started out with the idea of making an encyclopedia, so that quickly led to a list of a few thousand films. For this book, we had the idea of adding 500 films in a sort of reference gallery. Uh, again, that was um, not very practical. Uh, would have added too many pages. So we ended up adding about 150 films, or as we've termed it, 150 statues in films, um, all the way from uh, Meliès's first uh, Pygmalion Egalité, which we think to be the, the first sort of film that deals with statue in a very, statues in a very deliberate way, which is from 1898, one of his first films, incidentally, to uh, the last film, which is um, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug, uh, so you can also see that, whereas the first part of the book is perhaps a little more academic, we've done our best to combine uh, high and lowbrow in this second part. Um, and I've taken up the task of looking at a lot of contemporary films with a lot of joy for this uh, second part. So um, really what that looks like in the book is a reference gallery with short descriptions of what actually happens, hoping that this will spur on uh, future research, and if not, um, joyful reading at the very least. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few examples before I introduce uh, tonight's film of things that you might expect. And this is also, the reference gallery is also just a great, um, a great reference for if you're ever in need of which films to watch. They're all uh, a ton of fun. They're all relatively easy to find. Um, and there are probably a lot of films in there that you've never seen before. Fauno tonight will definitely be one. Uh, the early work of Meliès, I'm, I'm guessing that not a lot of people will turn to, uh, but is actually quite interesting. Um, I'm giving this as an example because you can all also look it up yourself. This is the first sculptural transformation in cinema uh, that we've found so far. We've gone through a lot of archives and uh, video material, but this is the earliest one that you could find. Uh, and it already gives you an idea of how instrumental the cinematic technology really is for bringing statues to life. Uh, I'll show you a few examples of what editing and lighting can do, but in its most uh, base part, it's the idea that you can stop and start the camera and that you can substitute, in this case, an actress for a cardboard frame, which is supposed to be a sculpture. Um, and that's really sort of at the root of a lot of these films. Um, it's what is known as the Pygmalion theme, also because, of course, the film here is called Pygmalion, uh, Pygmalion Egalité, if you want to go French on it, um, which refers back to the myth of Pygmalion, who's a Cypriot sculptor who um, supposedly made a statue that was so lifelike that he fell in love with it. There's actually a term for that, uh, since a lot of these films also deals, deal with people falling in love with statues. Uh, Agalmatophilia. Um, it's also a term for people who assault statues in the streets. That's also a thing. If you're from New York, you've probably seen it a few times. Um, but it's also a term for people falling in love with statues in film. So this first sort of transformation tries to uh, recapture that myth, the idea that uh, a person could make a sculpture that's so lifelike that the gods would bestow life upon it. Uh, there's, of course, a whole backstory to that mythology um, Pygmalion was somewhat of a misogynist who thought that all women or the women surrounding him were not good enough uh, and were lacking in certain values, so he decided to make one himself. So the objectification of women is quite present 
uh, in this myth and actually also in most of the films that you'll find. Uh, the film that you'll see tonight, uh, that's actually not the case. We'll see a reversal of the Pygmalion myth. So it's not the man bringing the uh, statue of the uh, woman to life, but it's the other way around. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's an actual tale of love in this case, as you'll see. So this is sort of at the basis of a lot of these films. We'll see a lot of reversals, takes on it. Um, what really made this a popular trope, because uh, I'm assuming that the story of Pygmalion today might not be uh, as good as a reference anymore. What was a good reference in the beginning of the 20th century and the late 19th century, because you had a lot of neoclassical stage plays that were bringing to life mythology once more. Um, Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, of course, was a variation on this, which came out in 1912. Um, but not only that, also the setting of antiquity in and of itself became something that was very popular to put on stage and um, therefore also made its way into film. Georges Méliès, of course, who was also a uh, magician and who also put up plays in his own uh, theater. So this is sort of the, uh, the earliest iteration and stage trickery all done inside the uh, camera. And that sort of directly translates to any other mythology that you might find out there that brings statues to life. And usually this is sort of the, sub, the subtext or the context. This is the, uh, the 1963 Jason and the Argonauts. Um, and this, of course, is the refinement of that cinematic technology, right? We have stop motion photography and matte photography at work here, if you're interested in that. Uh, you can always look that up. Not entirely different from what Melies was doing from a technical standpoint. Uh, actually not different at all, but just much more refined, uh, as you'll see. The 60s and 70s also, um, if the late 1900s and the, um, or the uh, late 1890s, the 1900s, uh, and the 1910s were a perfect breeding ground to find some characters like Pygmalion. Uh, Hercules is really the one you'll find in the 60s and 70s, and they'll usually throw in a few sculptures that he has to fight at some point. Uh, in this film, also skeletons. Um, but sort of the masterpiece of this film and of a lot of these films um, is bringing that texture and that material of what is meant to be a bronze statue and not, not a statue that you would find necessarily. It's actually based on a two-dimensional drawing. It's not a real statue, so to speak. So this was made especially for the film by Harryhausen. And the way that you'll see it move is perhaps how you might imagine a bronze or copper statue. Uh, moving around. So there's sort of a direct line all the way from Elias to Harryhausen and really hundreds of films that you can trace in between there. The uh, other approach here in L'Enfer de Rodin, a uh, film by Henri Alecan from the 50s, uh, is the more modernist approach, which is um, showing you new perspectives on sculpture. Uh, in the same way that a few years ago, a few of you might have seen this, um, cinemas made an event out of bringing you major painterly works. Uh, you could see the works of Van Gogh, for instance, in the way that you've never seen them before because they were shot in 4K. Um, you could see the Sistine Chapel the way that you've never seen it before because if you've been to the actual location, you know that you'll have to uh, stand like this and be shouted at by uh, Italian guards. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, mi scusi. Um, yes, Vatican Guards. Um, so the idea, of course, with uh, sculpture as well, and especially with something like uh, uh, the Gates of Hell, is that you'll never get close enough to see the details. You might not uh, be able to see the original casts or models uh, from up close. And so this is what cinema can add to that. It can also bring you better lighting than museum lighting, which uh, can, be, can be a positive uh, side thought as well. So uh, there are any number of experimental films, especially in the 50s and 60s, that try to bring this, um, bring works that you know to life in new and interesting ways, often also by adding uh, new music and adding a sort of personal narrative to it, which in effect is also what will happen tonight with uh, Tal's accompaniment. Uh, and then the other, I would say, um, if we're talking in generical terms, genre that we should mention, because from now on after you've uh, heard me talk about this, you'll see statues in pretty much every film. Um, and if you do, please make a list, send it to me afterwards so I can, for the revised edition. Um, 
it's really something that it is noticeable sometimes as a prop, sometimes it's used as a joke. Uh, one of those um, one of those generic conventions is the uh, the horror film, and the idea that a statue can at any point in time become alive or was once something living. Now, of course, if you've gone to a wax museum or if you want to um, go to Madame Tussauds uh, after this, or it's probably open 24 hours anyway, right? Um, you, you can see that there's certainly a, a truth to that. Um, now, the, the horror element was actually brought in quite early on in the 19th century again uh, in the Chamber of Horrors. So the idea uh, of the Chamber of Horrors is that uh, there is sort of a newsworthy component that is added into the museum. Um, in Madame Tussaud's case, it were uh, murderers and people who were murdered who had been in the headlines uh, in, in the 19th century especially. And those murders would be reenacted in the wax museum. Um, there's, of course, also the anatomical component. If you've, again, been to the Met Breuer or you've been to the La Specola Museum in uh, Italy, you'll see that for the very first anatomical models, wax was also used because it approximates the human body so well um, so that you would have mostly women, again, that you could sort of disassemble, uh, that were eroticized, objectified, and put into any number of positions and seemed very lifelike. Um, and there was always this idea that something more might happen. And something more did happen from historical records. We found out that uh, one, those museums like La Specola, but especially the more sensational ones, would allow uh, wealthy customers to pay extra for some alone time with the sculptures, which is something that happened. Um, I'm not sure how you feel about that morally, but you can think about that. Um, and another, of course, is the adding of effects and actors, um, both in wax museums, but also, of course, in more sensational fare. Um, haunted houses, I think, around this period are a very good place to look for those. And you can see that actually here in the, the wonderful uh, 1933 Mystery of the Wax Museum, where a lot of the sculptures, the so-called wax sculptures, especially in their close-ups, are really just actors who are noticeably actors, uh, who are also noticeably moving, if you see them longer than three seconds. Um, but the idea, of course, there is that the best way to make them seem lifelike is by using actual actors. Uh, you'll see Fay Ray in this film, famous from King Kong as well. If we take that to uh, another level, here in the sort of reimagining in three dimensions, uh, House of Wax from 1953, um, you can sort of see what that looks like, that play on texture. Um, if you've never seen House of Wax, I won't give too much away, but the, the, the gist of it is, and that's also the beginning of the film, is a famous sculptor loses all of his models in a big fire, um, fire not very conducive to wax, and seeks to recreate his masterpieces by um, claiming models from life or working on models from life. So a small layer of wax covers actual uh, live models. Now you can ask, why would you add wax if you already have the models? Doesn't that seem like a hard job? And it, it does seem like a hard job. Um, uh, but you can sort of see the, uh, the approximation there. This is one of the nosy reporters who finds out and who's sort of confronted with her future fate when presented with uh, her own head. You'll also see uh, a very young Charles Bronson there uh, in the left of the frame to the right who's one of the stooges who's multiplied in the film um, as well. So these are things that uh, were played on and that find their logical extension in later films, which become a little more gruesome. This is the uh, wonderful crucible of terror. Um, this is eventually what happens when, uh, in film at least, sculpt sculptors get very lazy. And this is how they um, try to approximate the figurative in a better way. Uh, which brings me also to uh, a good observations. If you're watching a film and um, a sculpture is too lifelike, that means it's probably going to come alive or it was once alive. So someone's encased in it. Um, and uh, on the other spectrum, if something looks too abstract, that you'll usually have the inference that the artist who made it is crazy. Uh, abstract art in film, whether it be painting or sculpture, uh, is usually a reference to the artist being crazy. Um, or something that will trigger that sort of uh, idea. 
Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide if that's taken from real life, but that's one of the cliches, at least, of, um, of art in film. Um, and if you are a sculptor, you'll, you'll also realize that this type of um, technique is actually not very practical, but it's, of course, the effect that they're, uh, the effect that they're going for. I'll leave the rest for you to discover in the book, or if you have any questions, uh, we can talk about them afterwards and talk a little bit about the, uh, the film that you'll see tonight. I won't give, try not to give away too many details from the plot. Uh, this is a wonderful um, German poster for the film, uh, which translates it as The Dream of Love, uh, an erotic play by Febo Mari. So it gives you a, an, another insight into what the film um, might be about. And it also plays, uh, like many of the posters of these films, on that textural difference between human flesh uh, and the sculpture. Um, and you can sort of, of course, also see where the erotic component uh, comes in. So even though the objectification in this film is mostly on the, the male body, uh, the, body of, the body of the fawn, uh, you'll still see the poster trying to objectify the woman who almost looks like a marble sculpture uh, herself. Um, since I saw that the Casa Italiana was doing a wonderful um, or was part of a wonderful exhibition on how photography and film sort of interacted uh, in neorealism. There's a wonderful book up there that you can have a look at. I thought I'd uh, highlight how this film also is a, um, an object of its time and was influenced by the art of its time. Um, most notably Rembrandt uh, and Rembrandt lighting. You might have heard this term before if you're a, a painter, photographer, or have looked into this. This was something that was somewhat of a hot topic at the time. Uh, if you look at uh, photography manuals of the day, this is a 1909 one, you'll see that the idea of Rembrandt lighting um, is, is quite present, to say the least. Now, what this really boils down to, this idea of Rembrandt lighting, is playing what in Italian is known as chiaroscuro, uh, or stark contrast between uh, light and darkness in the frame. Usually, it's sort of paired up with silhouettes, um, uh, contour lighting or against the light photography. And this is something that influenced cinema in Europe in the 1910s, especially um, the age, the golden age, the first golden age of European cinema. Uh, and that's something that you see translated, of course, here in New York, uh, in Steichen and Stiglitz's uh, camera work club, um, but that you'll also find in film. This is a a French film from 1912, L'Âme des Moulins, or The Soul of the Mill, um, that also gives you an idea of how color played into that. Because I'm not sure how many of you have seen a lot of silent films before, of how much you know. And we can talk more extensively, of course, afterwards. But most of the films that came out, at least in the 1910s and 1920s, uh, not so much before that, had both color um, and usually live music. So they were never shown silently. Um, and they were usually not in black and white. The reason that we see so many black and white silent films is because, um, one, the colored copies didn't survive, and so you get copies and dupes that were made in black and white, and they weren't colored, um, especially, for the, especially for the occasion. This is a, that's a bad omen. <laughs> I hope no one's trying to electro electrocute me here. here uh. Let's see how that goes. Uh, if you need me to stop, you can just you can just say so. <laughs> I won't go on too long, I promise. Uh, anyway, uh, I should probably skip that one. Um, and this was going to be my next one. So uh, the the reason that these films look so good, uh, not just in terms of uh, their color and lighting, but also their textural quality, and this is really where. Um, I feel early cinema especially has um, maybe the best analogy to sculpture because it's very textural, is that it was shot on nitrate cellulose or nitrate film. Um, one reason we don't do that anymore is because nitrate, uh, nitrate is very flammable. Um, in fact, it will burn underwater because it has its own oxygen sort of uh, in the print. Uh, this is just one reel of nitrate film. Uh, it's taken from a clip that lasts about 15 minutes. Um, so imagine you're in the projection booth and you have a lot of nitrate films lying around and um, one of them gets stuck in front of that hot light that is supposed to transmit the light for the film. Well, this uh, essentially will happen and then everything will go up into flames. Um, 
there's a, a great example in uh, *Inglorious Bastards*, the Tarantino film. This is sort of a a, a nitrate moment, and um, uh, this is you know what would happen with those films. So that's why they don't use them anymore. But it's really hard to compare the quality of later what's known as safety films to actual nitrate. You'll see some of that in this uh, digital restoration, which was taken from original nitrate prints from uh, the Cineteca in Friuli and was um, sort of put back together uh, with added color, which is known as tinting and toning, two chemical processes uh, put back together by the Cinematheque uh, Royale de Belgique, the, uh, the Belgian uh, Cinematheque, which actually invented a color process to approximate this type of uh, photography. It's actually quite, quite unique. Um, hence also the saying, nitrate won't wait. It's a, a favorite term by um, archivists, not just because it deteriorates, but also because it literally, once it catches fire, you need to get out of the way. Um, this is what that sort of translates to. Some great films, if you haven't seen them already. Probably not. Twilight of a Woman's Soul, a Russian film from 1913. Um, and essentially cinematography that approximated photography so much that you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference uh, between what is uh, photography and what is uh, cinematography, were it not, of course, for certain uh, aspect ratios. So the, uh, the bottom half are all examples from European cinema of the 1910s, and the um, top half are approximations in uh, photography. So you'll see that these sort of motifs live on, um, and there isn't actually a book on this yet, so don't beat me to it. Uh, maybe we can come back with, uh, with that. You'll see a lot of these motifs also in Fauno, which is why I'm, why I'm sharing it with you tonight. Um, Fauno is a, um, a unique film by a unique director, I would say, a director who is known more, if, if he's known today at all, he was known more as an actor, Thibaut Mari, um, who started in uh, around 1912 and worked until the late 1920s. And he's actually more well known for the actresses that he played with. If you've been to uh, an Italian silent film screening before, you'll know that the uh, Italian cinema of the 1910s was especially defined by its strong female characters, know as, known as the divas. Uh, and so these films were known as the diva films, which were very operatic in their performance. Uh, usually these women were strong women who consumed men, and Febo Mari was often the person being consumed by these strong females. Uh, in these great films. Il Fuoco is uh, one of them um, with the great Pina Menichelli, who's one of the uh, Italian divas of the period. Um, another film that he's famous for his co-starring role is uh, Cenere or Ashes, which is the only film that uh, Eleonora Duse ever made. Uh, and incidentally, this is the film that he met his wife in. It was her first film, Nieta Mordelia, who is also his uh, co-actor in this film. So uh, Mari was actually quite a, um, uh, quite a convinced director in, and quite a confirmed director in the 1910s. Uh, this is one of his more poetic films. He has some very strongly socially uh, and socialist inspired films, inspired by the likes of Emile Zola in the 1910s. Um, but this film is decidedly not that. Uh, it's really a film poem, and you'll see that by the way that uh, Mari himself introduces the film. He really introduces the film as if you're going to, um, let's say, an early 20th century unveiling of a new painting or a new sculpture. Uh, the drapes will literally be pulled open by Mari. Um, he'll recite a poem for you. Not actually, of course, because it's a silent film. Uh, but if we can get any volunteers to recite, we might be able to do that. Um, and this was very much in the vein of the art films that were being made at the time. Films that were um, intently artistic and that were being sold as prestige products to um, reel in the bourgeoisie and the upper classes to film. Film which was seen especially in the, uh, before the 1910s as sort of a working class medium, but which really developed into a medium for all classes into the 1910s. And one of the ways they uh, did that was by um, pulling in painting and sculpture that people knew and that they could relate to and uh, subject matter that people could relate to. Um, this also meant working with screenwriters like uh, Gabriela D'Annunzio, who is of course also a famous novelist. And so the way that Febo Mari introduces this film is very much taken from that D'Annunzio style. 
uh, if you will. It's also in the cinematography. You can see a little bit of it here, but become more apparent. This is the first time you get to see the actual sculpture, which was made especially for the film. Uh, we haven't been able to find any sort of remains on who the artist was, unfortunately. And it's, of course, uh, like in many cases, a, a sculpture of the artist. Um, uh, uh, the artist, in this case, both the director, Febo Mari, but, but also the star, Febo Mari. So there's, there's something narcissistic to the next level about this type of um, portrait or sculpture, if you will. Now, a lot of times, if these sculptures are made especially for a film, they're also destroyed afterwards. Um, and a lot of times, you get different versions. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are actually little differences between the sculpture when it pops up from time to time. Um, Here's that pictorial photography I was talking about. This is Nieta Mordelia hanging over incense in the fire. Uh, and that sort of chiaroscuro background lighting uh, or backlit lighting that you'll see a lot. And the idea of the texture of the statue seeping into the film. And of course, I won't reveal the uh, transformation scenes necessarily, but I wanted to give you somewhat of an, of an insight how to, uh, into how this film was made and how it's gonna look uh, and where it came from. And you'll see that it's really on the more experimental or poetic side, especially for the 1910s. Now, I'll give you a, sort of a basis for the plot. But the idea of the film is that uh, Nieta Mordelia, known as sort of the, uh, the artist's model, uh, is neglected by the artist. And the, the figure of the artist in film generally, uh, it's not great. Uh, he's usually, it's usually he to start with. He's usually a womanizer. Uh, he's usually debauched, especially if he makes abstract art. Uh, then he's probably a murderer. Um, so, we, you know, just putting that out there. Uh, in this film, he neglects his model slash girlfriend because, of course, in film, artists' models are also artists' girlfriends, um, sometimes sporadically, usually sporadically. Um, the neglect leads to a relationship of sorts, of sorts with a statue of a fawn that he has uh, in his gallery. The rest you can sort of piece together yourself because this is actually narratively also quite a complicated film for the period. Uh, flashbacks were not... Uh, something that was only invented in the 1940s. And the same thing for um, dream scenes, which is what you'll find here. Um, the film is sort of a dream within a dream within a dream. And you can sort of see how far that, uh, that carries. Um, and the jealousy that you'll see inherent between these two women and their affection over the statue is what really drives most of the, uh, the plot for the film. And I'll leave you with some um, pictorial setting suns um, to enjoy the rest of the film. But uh, finally, I also want to introduce, of course, our, um, our artist for the evening, uh, Tal Stuhl, if he's still, oh, there he is. He's, he's still around, uh, if he's not already left. Um, <laughs> don't give artists a bad name. Uh, so uh, Tal, who is a, a talented woodwindist, when I asked him which instruments are you, or did you have with you, he said, all of the instruments, so it'll be a treat. Uh, in this case, it'll be the, uh, the saxophone, the clarinet, and the flute, uh, <coughs> especially, I think, suited to such a pastoral and poetic film. Um, Tall has a, a BA from Temple University in music, uh, and an MA in music from the University of Arts. He hails from Philadelphia. Uh, he's performed or recorded with a ton of people. I'm just putting a few of these uh, out there. Terrell Stafford's Jazz Orchestra of Philadelphia, Rodney Green, John Legend, uh, Patti LaBelle, Smokey Robinson, Paul Schaefer, and many, many others. Um, and has uh, composed a score especially for the film. Um, I should add that this is also the period where uh, scores uh, were not, were usually improvised for films or sort of made, um, uh, they, they weren't made available afterwards. So every time you would go see this type of film, much like you would see today, you'll see a different type of musical interpretation for it, which is also what uh, you'll be hearing tonight. So that should be uh, quite a treat. So give him a hand um, already. He will be composing it live. There we go. All right. <laughs> 
So uh, enjoy the film, I would say. Thank you very much, Vito. And uh, before we start the screening, I just want to add that the film has been restored by the Royal Cinematheque of Belgium. Yes. Copies from uh, Cineteca del Friuli. But something was done also here at the Casa. We oh, provided yes. the English intertitles uh, in-house, and Eugenio Pizzorno did them for us. So we also added a little touch of our own. It's true, quite artistic too, <laughs> I must say. I've seen them already, so they look great. Thank you. Enjoy, and uh, remember that we're going to have a Q&A with the music musician and with uh, Vito at the end of the movie. Enjoy. I'm curious to know just the technology, the cameras that they could bring into uh, the countryside and and whatnot. Well, so if you want to have a, uh, a good look at one of the cameras they would have used in the 1910s, the, uh, the Museum of the Moving Image has a bunch of them on show. Um, in 1910, because you weren't dealing with any sort of sound technology, cameras were actually quite compact. Um, and for the most part, the, uh, the mechanical camera uh, really went, you know, technologically speaking, unchanged until the age of digital. The same with projection booth. They, they look almost exactly the same projectors as the early 1900s. So what you really had was uh, a compact box, something like this, um, that they used both for you know, inside studio shoots as for exteriors. Um, and the nitrate film stock that they used was quite light sensitive um, and could pick up quite a range of um, uh, I, I guess I want to say lights and colors, but I mean textures, especially if you shoot at the sky, for instance, you'll get a whole different result with nitrate film stock. Um, but there wasn't, a lot of, there wasn't a lot of variety at this point, not a lot of different lenses uh, that wouldn't come until the 1920s. Um, but I think most of the effects that you see and the quality of it is, is the nitrate film stock and the decision to sort of shoot against the light to get those really... I guess by now they've become sort of cliched images that you would expect on Instagram of sunsets. <laughs> um, but this was, this was sort of at the, uh, the age of their invention, so to speak. And, and what about editing potential? I mean, most of that was just done um, after the fact. Very early on you would do everything in camera, so that meant that if you had uh, special effects you would stop the camera and then you would start the camera. But really after like two years, uh, they would just create copies of the film, make a work print, so cut a version of the print and then do it on the camera negative, which is again how they used to do it on film uh, before digital. Yeah, so it's really not, um, um, there's not a lot of change in that for the remainder of shooting on film, except the addition of sound yeah. and color. <laughs> yes? Uh, several things I comment on. It's one of the most glorious surreal films I've ever seen. Uh, I could I could get the dialogue from the screen, and with that throaty fluting and sad saxophone, it was extraordinary. It was this was one of the most unexpectedly glorious film experiences I ever experienced. I could shout this if I had to. The uh, this uh, Cocteau. Or uh, what? What um, Nijinsky come th come to mind? Um, I noted that in two cases, in, in there were two modes. One was the bluish mode, and one was the uh, orangey mode. Or were those the two positives that you worked from? That's one question. And secondly, there were certain areas where, uh, when uh, early on, he, it, it seems as though there's a kind of an aureole of flame. Is that when the nitrate is beginning to? disintegrate. So th those are the questions of technology, which follow my comment of ecstatic. Well, first of all, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, uh, so the, you, can, you can at times see the, the two prints being combined, the two positives, but that's more so in terms of quality. So uh, early on, you do indeed see that sort of the flamey effect is indeed the nitrate deteriorating, and you can only clean that up so much. Um, when it's gone, it's gone. So that's sort of that effect. It's almost eaten away, uh, which it actually actually is. Uh, it turns into um, sort of a mush and it gets a vinegary smell. It's known as vinegar syndrome. Um, but you actually had a 
you had more colors that were present sort of playing on greenish yellowish hues, uh, different types of blues, um, and both prints had different types of uh, colors, uh, in fact, yeah. So y usually when, we're, when they would um, use color for films, they would do it by emotional tone. Um, so you actually see combinations of two pr uh, processes known as tinting and toning. Uh, with tinting, they just put the entire film into sort of a, a bath of color. And toning is a chemical process that actually um, swaps out the blacks. So that's why some of the blacks have sort of a yellowish or greenish color, depending on the print, so that you get really color in sort of the whole spectrum. Um, the only practical color, usually blue is night. And if there's a fire, if they want to amplify that effect, you'll get red. But everything else is sort of emotional tone, and they'll change that up by scene. Um, so both of these prints had some of that, and then they were put together on availability afterwards. Yeah, some of it might also be restored by the Cinematheque, but that's unclear. Yeah. Anyone else? I have a question, but first of all, for me too, it was surprising, and I'm not very familiar with uh, silent Italian cinema. I mean, it's beyond my field of expertise, but this was a, a complete surprise. And I have a question for uh, for Vito. Uh, compared to the other uh, films made by uh, Febo Mari, that's the name of the, um, how does this one uh, rank in terms of, especially of the surreal element? I was wondering whether it was deliberate or whether it sort of escaped from his hands and became something surreal against his um, will. And this doubt comes to me because he closes with a quote from Manzoni that is you know, the most canonical, um, romantic um, author of novels. He's like the, the canon of 19th century literature. So to close such a surreal experience uh, with a reference to Manzoni, it's the thing that threw me off a little bit. So it's a double question. How does this compare to the other productions by Mari, and whether it was deliberately surreal or it ended up being surreal in our eyes? So to answer the, the first part, I think if you compare it to um, some of his other films, like Le Migrante, which is a 1915 film, um, they, I would say they're more uh, socially inspired and in retrospect probably more neorealistic sort of against uh, the, s the Italian cinema of the 40s and 50s if you would look back so more slices of life and this one definitely stands out as uh, more of a fairy tale um, which brings me to the second part uh, and that is that really you have a sort of a multitude of films of the 1910s and 1910s especially but early 1920s as well that in retrospect we can't but assess as surreal when really they were very ne neoclassically inspired, very romantic, things you would see on uh, the stage as big romantic plays, as fairy tales, um, as Christmas pantomimes, um, but that people working in the 1920s and later sort of recognized that potential for the surreal. And someone like Cocteau was heavily inspired by this poetic cinema of the 1920s, uh, 1910s and the uh, even the French Impressionists working in the 1920s were heavily inspired by some of the stuff that went on. René Magritte's, um, one of René Magritte's first paintings, for instance, was directly inspired by a, a sensationalist serial of the time by Louis Feuillard, uh, Fantomas. So there's this idea that you have characters in these films that are, whether it be above nature or outside the law, um, Machiste, for instance, as well. Yeah, he was. It's almost like a classic after that. Yes, well, actually, there, there is one where he. Um, well, there's another film uh, in which uh, a Machiste like character uh, poses as a statue to catch some bad guys. Uh, machiste is the, the f one of the first um, superheroes in the 1910s and especially 1920s, sort of a peplum hero, a strong man, really, who comes from a background of strong men. Um, so he was also at the same time that um, Febo, Mato, Febo Mari was making these kinds of films active. But these were seen as sort of um, uh, sensational films that didn't have necessarily something highbrow about them. This one, of course, was meant to be 
as you could see by the tuxedo that Fibo Mati was wearing when he opens the curtain. It's meant to be very highbrow. Um, but that highbrow in the 1910s really meant referring back to things that people knew, so famous paintings, famous plays, famous novelists, um, and wasn't seen as cutting edge necessarily. Uh, it's a question. It's a. It, it wasn't about statues, but I saw it at the um, Italian Culture Institute had a, a silent movie. It was very long, and I think they said it was the first Italian silent movie, and it was about Dante going into hell to rescue the poet. Are you familiar with that? Um, I think it. Did you? No, I don't know the film, but. That's that's from Dante's Inferno, right? Yeah, but there was there was also with music. There was a clar a saxophone player, and I think a piano, if I'm not mistaken. But it was maybe about four or five years ago. It was very long. <laughs> so I don't know what year it was when it was performed or. I don't think it's the first Italian film. Uh huh. Movie, but it's definitely one of the early films, and I've seen. Have you seen it? Not, not the whole film. No, it was very long. <laughs> Yeah, it was very long. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there is maybe also something to be said about the fact that they look for subjects that uh, require special effects. They wanted to uh, explore the full length of, of special effects, like Kabiria, that is the, the most quoted and the colossal representation. It has like the dream that appears as a sort of projected on on the wall when the princess is dreaming and many other th things of that sort. It's and of course Dante lent itself for for that kind of it's special fine. effects until later because they had to come up with how to produce them. Yeah, there were, I mean there were um, quite a lot of epic films being produced from 1908 onwards that really took a lot of historical events that were brought to life um, you know, dealing with Roman history especially, but then also adaptations of um, stage plays and the fall of Troy and Pompeii, obviously, also early on. So I know there's an Inferno film from 1910, so that definitely wouldn't have been the first Italian silent film, but probably one of the first major productions of that sort, especially if it was, uh, if you, as you say, very long. Um, the first feature-length films weren't being made until 1910, 1911, so that's when you would see sort of 45, 60 minutes. Uh, and in terms of special effects, uh, this film is actually quite toned down. There's a, there's a few instances where you can see, um, I think almost deliberately, a slight superimposition, right? When you think the statue is going to come alive, they could have just as easily tried to sort of superimpose a, uh, an image of Febo Mari himself so that they could slowly fade it in because that's what Melies was doing in 1890, uh, in 1898, so, but they, choose not, they chose not to do that, so that's, that's uh, interesting. This is uh, 1917. Yeah, so by then you... I think so, yeah. 11? Sorry about that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? A question for Tal. Um, it was mentioned that most of the time the music uh, was improvised. Uh, this is about the third, only the third silent film I've ever heard with live music, and most of the time it's piano. So having uh, the wind instruments, and especially being your, that you're a jazz musician, was very different. I was wondering how, uh, what your process was in deciding what to, how to play this. Uh, <laughs> play this film, so to speak? Well, thank you. That's a very good question, obviously. Um, it's kind of a new experience for me as well. Um, most films aren't scored with a single instrument. As you mentioned, it's usually like a piano, so you can get all, all the different orchestral effects, chords and everything, two voices, three voices, six voices. Um, so um, this is actually my first time doing a single instrument, and Basically what I did, I watched the movie once through to get get the idea of it, the pacing of it, um, the ups and downs of it, um, which scenes are more prolonged and would require a little bit more, I mean, more in depth of development of like a theme of music. Um, and then I watched it a second time just to 
you know, make sure I knew where everything was. I, I picked up on some visual cues. I hope that was obvious. Um, <laughs> I did what I could. This was all improvised as well. I didn't really write anything in advance. Um, and basically, I'm a woodwind player, so I try, I try to use the range of sounds um, as best as I can to portray the widest range of um, emotions and just characteristics um, in different parts of the film. So, you know, the, the clarinet, I thought, um, was good for the woodsy scene and also kind of, for the most part, being the theme for the fawn, the clarinet, and then the flute um, was the main lady. For the most part, you know, there were moments where I kind of switched over and did something else. But the saxophone, um, I guess, was more of... Saxophone has the widest range, so that has kind of a more of an orchestral ability. I mean, I'm saying this very loosely, like nobody would ever mistake a saxophone for an orchestra. But in this rare case where I have some extreme limitations on scoring an entire film, you know, I work with what I have. I can also add on to that, that there's a, for silent film accompaniment at least, the weird misconception that piano is the the go-to uh, instrument. Um, there is historically the case that a lot of cinemas would have um, pianos, but most of them that actually had a piano in-house would also have the ability to uh, have multiple musicians in, and usually they would just work with what they had on hand. Um, not always house musicians, so it could really be anything and everything. Um, and it's not until the 1920s that actual scores are made loosely here and there for specific films. Uh, and even then, they would never be performed because you would have to hire an entire orchestra, and no one wants to pay for that. Um, there's also a misconception that silent films should be sh shown uh, silent. Uh, the Cinémathèque Française ran with that for a very long time as sort of a historical snobism, um, but that, that, that's actually historically inaccurate. <laughs> so if you go to France and you see silent film silent, say j'accuse <laughs> or something, <laughs> something like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. No, and often also uh, narration. Um, people who would do, if you have dialogue, would do the voices. Uh, it's most known in the Japanese tradition as the tradition of the benshi. Uh, if you get a chance to see that live, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience. So people would do voices, sometimes even sound effects. Um, but you would actually have that in Europe too, to the point where you would have narrators that people would come to see and not the film. Yeah. Uh, just to change it up a little bit, could you talk a little bit about the coda and about the film uh, becoming sculpture and about, I'm guessing that that is something in the contemporary age and you're talking about installation and the use of film and, and sculpture objects and, and things like that. Is that kind of what that, cha that ending is about? I'm curious. Yes, yeah, exactly. We felt that um, if we wanted to, you know, cover most of the uh, interactions between sculpture and cinema, or at least cinema in the sense of projected light and sculpture, uh, that we would have to account for expanded cinema experiments, for especially from the 1960s and 70s onwards. Thing that are, things that are harder to categorize and that you can't just um, that you can't just watch or see or feel in the same way that you can a sculpture or a film, let's say. So things that sort of fall right in between those two. Um, and that's really what the, what the coda accounts for. So um, there's a lot of American experimentalists in there that worked both on film and made sculptural objects, but then also sort of created um, sculptural lightscapes, I think is probably the best term for that. And there's also some um, sculptural work in there that you could only see by means of camera uh, landscape art, for instance, that you know, would require someone to go over, over it and film it so that you see it from a particular perspective. Yeah. Uh, does that include d digital work as well? Or does it sort of end with, with, the, with film? Or do you, in, in that era from the 60s to the present, do you kind Sorry. of go in? Do you go into the use of digital projection as, as contemporary film? Or is it only film oh, work? Yeah, yeah, that's in there as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and in, I think in many cases today, especially, um, 
the digital projector really um, makes it much more practical for the, you know, those kinds of works to exist and for you to watch them. Um, because you can map it out digitally on your MacBook, so to speak. So it's, it's very easy to guide. Um, if you, so let's say you have one projector, like the one that you know, projected this film, you could very easily parcel out the little light stream so that you have different streams with different films being shown at the same time. And uh, if you walk through those things, it's a very different experience. Uh, uh, but it's hard to capture on film. <laughs> I look forward to the book. So. Thank you. First of all, uh, very well done, wonderful work on the uh, <coughs> accompaniment. Um, the, the the concept, the the theme of the transformation of from the inanimate to to the real is. Is, is fairly broad and and reaches into into many aspects of of art. I was just wondering, did did you look at television as well? Because, for example, the Twilight Zone had some very notable episodes. There was one about a mannequin. There was one about an evil doll. So, or is it just purely cinema? And and the the second question you you just mentioned, sort of weirdness or or uh, atypical 60s experimental cinema. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of narrative weirdness, did you, Greenaway comes to mind, and there's a great element in the draftsman's contract using, using statues. So I was just wondering, did, did you focus on comprehensible um, instances of, of uh, statuary or did you also include sort of the uh, fringe consciousness kind of storytelling also? So, so you'll have to excuse me for the two questions. No, that's all right. That's a, that's a good question, actually, because it was very hard to um, decide on what to include in the book and where to draw the lines. And the, I think the Wax Museum chapter is where we sort of drew the line because you're dealing with wax statues which are from a often time from a different type of entertainment context not high art so to speak um, and at the same time you have a lot of uh, mannequins that come to life because um, in different contexts Melies uses them uh, in a very sort of visceral way he takes them apart and tears limbs off and then they come to life through substitution splices you know they turn human then he rips some limbs off um, they're very easy to work with as a substitution. And then um, from the 70s onwards, you also get a lot of horror films, and in the 80s, even some corny uh, commercial flicks like Mannequin um, that you know, are sort of the, the new wax doll is, is the mannequin doll that looks very lifelike. So there's that, and we included some of the, the mannequin side, uh, but then we decided to draw the line at dolls, and, and even there's really a whole spectrum of um, figurative inanimate objects becoming animate. Uh, robots would be the sort of the next logical extension. Oftentimes there are sculptures as well, like in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Um, these are also sort of creations and they mix different types of mythology, religion, uh, literature, obviously also Frankenstein. Um, so all things that are sort of topical at that time. So we, we drew the line for the most part at cinema. There is some television in there. Um, but really, we were dealing with sort of 2,000 films already, so we're sort of trying to pare that down. And then we try to get as many of our favorites and things that weren't necessarily touched upon because they were more fringe or because they didn't fit into any sort of category in the second part, which is the 150 films. And again, that sort of it was going to be 400, then 250, then 150. Um, but there also we had to draw the line. We chose American and European cinema because that was a most of them were from. I snuck in some Japanese films in another chapter. Um, no television. And then Greenaway is, is um, heavily discussed in the book. Um, Belly of an Architect also, and uh, obviously because that deals uh, very directly with uh, sculpture. And um, the Tableau Vivant and the Draftsman's uh, contract as well. Uh, and the rest of those fringe works are really mostly relegated to the, um, to the coda. <laughs> 
you know, like it could be a book in and of itself. Uh, hopefully it will be someday. I think that's it. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you for coming. I would like to thank both of you for having given us this fantastic evening. I learned a lot. I had fun, and I think we really were in for a unique, absolutely unique experience, and we enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you very much, really. Thank you.